And yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about predicting species range dynamics. I try to keep the time because I'm also quite curious to hear um, the other three talks. Um, just a little bit of background. Probably all of you know that we are in the midst of a global biodiversity crisis, that uh, we see tremendous losses um, of biodiversity. Here's just an example of the Living Planet Index that summarizes the average abundance of vertebrate populations. And what we have seen over the last decades is shocking. We have seen like a, um, a drop in the average abundance of 68% since the 1970s over all groups that have been analyzed. And in freshwater species, that's even more alarming with 84% declines, uh, while the declines in terrestrial and marine species are still quite large with more than 30%. And we have also seen over the last decades, like an exciting new development, the IPBES, the International Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And one of their goals is also to stimulate new analytical and modeling work for scientific policy support. So basically we want to use models to explore how nature will respond to different pathways of future human development and policy choices. So for, in the end for bending this biodiversity curve. What do we have to do to, to actually reinstall biodiversity or at least hold biodiversity? Um, and modeling is one major part of that. And also the models that I'm going to highlight today have been um, specified in a methodological assessment report by IPBES. Um, another small background on what we actually observe. So we have, already observed species range shifts um, on Earth. Here's an example um, based on a global matter analysis by Janet Al from already a decade ago. And there they summarized the um, latitudinal shifts, the northward shifts that we have observed in uh, mainly terrestrial species and also the elevational shifts. And we see that on average species have been moving almost 17 kilometers per decade northward or 11 meter per decade upward. And what we also see, especially here in the elevational shifts, is that um, when we compare that against the expected shifts, which we can deduce from the climate trajectory, then the observed shifts are actually much smaller than what we would expect. So one of the critical questions we have to ask ourselves for, for modeling is like, what are the processes that determine whether a rain shift is, um, is fast enough to track climate change and why it maybe isn't? So here just a schematic exemplifying like what could happen under global change. Um, the green field patch is the current distribution of the species. Then there's um, like a part of that um, current area that is becoming unsuitable under global change. And then we have several patches that are becoming suitable under global change in the future. However, not all of them might be colonizable. So here in the green hatched patches, these are colonizable, meaning the species or the individuals can reach those habitats, they can establish a viable population there. But then we might also have habitats that are suitable or that are becoming suitable, but that are not colonizable because of various reasons. For example, because there might be a dispersal barrier or the distance that is required um, to be uh, traversed by the species is simply too long. Um, so th th there we have a dispersal limitation. Of course, you could say, well, the species can actually use these habitats here as a stepping stone, but then there might be additional factors like competitors, predators, uh, stochastic effects that would prevent the species to establish a viable population there. And also here in this area that is becoming unsuitable, there's the question whether the species will go locally extinct there or whether it might persist some longer just because of some extinction debt or because it's actually adapting to the new environments. So there are a number of key mechanisms that we need to take into account in order to understand um, species response or biodiversity response to global change. And that's 
of course, how's the environment changing in the first place? What are all those different drivers? Then um, what's the species physiology, the demography, the dispersal capacity, which species interactions are at play and what's the adaptive potential of the species? The models that have been most often used in the past for predicting biodiversity response are correlative species distribution models. I guess most of you are familiar with them. Um, and they are really, they have a tremendous success. There are thousands of publications every year. And part of the reason is certainly because they have comparably low data requirements. And on the other hand, we have loads of tools and guidelines for using them. So um, they, simply require like spatial information on the biodiversity component, for example, presence absence data or presence only data, abundance or species richness. And they need um, geographic layers of the environmental conditions here, for example, annual temperature and grassland cover. And as I said, we have loads of different algorithms and tools available for then establishing um, the species environment relationships. So what's the occurrence probability of the species given the environmental conditions. And by that, we want to approximate the ecological niche of the species um, and want um, to, to say like, which are the environmental conditions um, that um, could hold like a presence of the species. And once we have established that species environment relationship, we can project that back into geographic space, make predictions on the current environments, make predictions to different places or to different times, for example, the future. Now, these models have been criticized for, uh, for quite a long time. One reason is what we have already heard, that species respond dynamically to global change. So what SDMs would predict in this case that we have already seen is that basically all of these habitats are suitable in the future, except like this red hedged area. Uh, but we don't know, or the models won't tell us how fast the species can reach those areas. It will not tell us whether it could establish a viable population and so on. The other problem is that all of these processes that we see here might already be acting on the species distribution today, right? So we have biotic constraints on the niche. Um, we know Hutchinsonian niche theory that the realized niche um, can be smaller than the fundamental niche because of um, community processes. And here I would like to extend that a little bit and say that the realized and observed niche might be affected both by demographic and community processes. They might look smaller um, because of dispersal limitation, because of interactions like competition predation. Um, but the niche could also appear larger, like the occupied or realized niche could also appear larger than the fundamental niche because of source sink dynamics, because of extinction deaths, facilitation, adaptation. So over the last well, decade or more, we have seen quite a few incentives for improving SDMs or for, for integrating different processes. For example, dispersal and demography um, in so what I call dynamic distribution models, but we've also seen incentives for um, uh, integrating adaptation and plasticity. Uh, we have seen mechanistic niche models that are built on physiological constraints rather than correlations. And we uh, just uh, very recently see the developments of joint species distribution models that try to disentangle environmental response and species interactions. Very roughly, we can say that on the left hand side, we have more dynamic approaches on the right hand side, more static approaches, but of course, that's a continuum. And today I'm going to talk more about these dynamic distribution models. Um, just to give you a very simple introduction. So basically, we want to integrate demography and dispersal. So when you look at this very simplified landscape where we have um, patches where we have roe deer present and we want to know how likely is it that the roe deer will also reach the other habitat patches um, that are currently empty um, and that um, they can establish a viable population there. So what we want to do is, first of all, we want to describe um, the local population dynamics in each patch, for example, um, by uh, by a population model that could be as simple as a logistic growth model or by more complicated models like matrix population models that take into account different life stages here, um, for example, a juvenile and an adult stage where only the adult stage can reproduce. 
The next thing we want to do is describe the dispersal capacity of the species. How likely is it to reach the other patch? And we can describe that by a simple um, dispersal kernel that is exemplified here. So from the position that the species is in, how probable is it that it will reach um, adjacent places? Or we can also simulate dispersal by an explicit movement simulator and um, simulate um, individual decisions, for example, while moving the perceptual range of the species and so on. The landscape can also look very differently. It could be described simply as a patch matrix landscape, as we see here. It could be described by patch types of different quality. It could be a grid of, uh, of cells with different quality and so on. So that can be very flexible. I would just want to give you two examples of what we could do with these dynamic distribution models. Well, first of all, they allow us to ask really what if questions, what happens to the population if uh, specific conditions take place. So in this case, we um, try to model the black grouse distribution and population dynamics in Switzerland under scenarios of global change and what we um, and we used uh, such dynamic distribution models for that. And what we found, for example, is that suitable habitat and the simulated occupied area, they can differ quite a lot, which means that the suitable habitat that SDMs are predicting for us can also not give us like a very good picture of uh, potential extinction risks. But we also found that the uncertainty in range predictions, which you see here, so here the colored lines are the different climate scenarios, but then you see the whole gray in the background and also here for the relative population size, you see a lot of gray. These are the sensitivity analysis results that we um, did and we found that the uncertainty due to the demographic components can be much larger than, for example, uncertainty due to different climate scenarios, meaning that we really need to understand species demography and how that might change under um, future environments. Another example, um, which is very recent, um, a colleague of mine at Humboldt University did uh, dynamic distribution models on the Caucasian leopard, trying to um, explore the recolonization ability of the species for the greater Caucasus under different management scenarios. So here you see um, the Caspian Sea um, and the Black Sea. And we currently have like a small population of Caucasian leopard here on the southern tip of the um, Caspian Sea in Iran. And we want to know like how likely is it that the um, species can recolonize these um, areas here in the greater Caucasus. The dark gray indicates where suitable habitat is. And then we analyze different scenarios of prey restoration. So if we increase prey abundance again, how will that benefit um, uh, recolonization? And we analyze different persecution reduction scenarios. So if we reduce poaching, how will that benefit recolonization? And we found, for example, that reducing uh, persecution, reducing poaching is much more effective at ensuring this recolonization of Caucasian leopards than just restoring prey. Okay, so just as a few examples. What is important to realize is that there is no single dynamic distribution model. So as you've seen with my little um, rodeo landscape before, we can of course choose between different kinds of models. And uh, more generally, we can distinguish models that still rely on correlative species distribution models as uh, for kind of describing the landscape context. Um, yeah, so-called coupled SDM demography models. So there we still take the SDM output, either the predicted presence absence or the habitat suitability, and we couple that with a population model and with a dispersal model, or only with a dispersal model would also be possible. The problem is that we have to define how this relationship looks like between the demographic rate or the dispersal rate and habitat suitability. And it could be linear, as you see here, but it could also be sigmoidal, it could be linear above a threshold, it could be just a threshold relationship. We simply don't have very strong theoretical or empirical evidence um, about this relationship. So this is why um, colleagues of mine came up uh, with a different approach a couple of years ago, what they called dynamic range models. 
I here just call them hierarchical models because dynamic range models uh, some, um, sometimes sounds too broad and you might confuse it with just general dynamic distribution models. So they used hierarchical models, meaning a Bayesian approach to simultaneously estimate um, the demography environment relationship and process rates of the population model. So that's um, more um, of how Hutchinsonian defined the niche that uh, we want to know where the intrinsic growth rate of the species is above zero. So what are the environmental conditions that allow um, viable populations. And this is much more grounded in ecological theory, whereas the other models are much more flexible. And what we wanted to know a couple of years ago is how does that flexibility or theoretical underpinning drive prediction accuracy. Um, the problem is, of course, that we're talking about predictions into the future. So we basically want to know how good are our forecasts and how far into the future. So what's the forecast horizon? When is uh, forecast proficiency dropping below a specific um, threshold? One problem for evaluating that is that future has not happened. So we often don't know uh, or we don't have evaluation data as, fast into the, uh, as far into the future. And the other problem is that for example, now we have like time series of 30 years of global change, but even if we evaluate these models and these kind of data, we still have the problem that we're often we don't know why forecast proficiency is dropping. So that's why we used a virtual ecologist approach where we could control all factors. So we created a virtual world, a virtual playground, where we had like a focus species and interacting species within a community. And we manipulated different community processes. So we tested single species versus uh, communities with a, in a species sorting scenarios or in neutral communities. And we manipulated different demographic processes. We had short uh, range dispersal versus long range dispersal. We had sourcing dynamics. We had additional uh, stochasticity through disturbances and so on. And then we sampled this virtual world. Um, according to protocols as we would have in the in the real world. So we sampled occurrence data, abundance time series, demographic rates, and so on, and fed that into different uh, models, into correlative species distribution models, into those coupled SDM uh, demography models, and into those hierarchical models. And then we made predictions on the current environments, but also on the future environments. And now the nice thing is that we don't only validate it against a subsample of our data, but we can validate it against our full virtual truth. And we know all of the processes that are going on in the background. And we can also run our virtual community into the future. And that way also validate all of the dynamics that are happening under climate change, whether our different models that we're testing, these ones, whether they are getting these dynamics right or not. I don't want to go too much into detail, but uh, the models that we tested differed um, in, in the features and the processes that they covered and, and how they were calibrated and also in the output. So roughly we had correlative species distribution models. Um, and we used an ensemble approach um, combining maximum likelihood with machine learning methods, et cetera. And the output that we get are habitat suitability maps or predicted presence or absence maps. And then we had four different range dynamic models or dynamic distribution models. Three of them were these coupled models, which still need the input from the SDMs. So, so the different maps that the SDMs are producing. And the first model developed in, um, in Lausanne, actually, the Micklin model just couples um, the SDM with a dispersal kernel. The Demonich model is a matrix population model um, on top of the SDM and the dispersal kernel. And Lollipop uses just a, a simple logistic growth model on top of the dispersal and SDM. And um, Micklin, obviously, um, just uses dispersal as a, as a process and will um, tell us something about the colonization probability, whereas the other two models um, also cover birth and death rates and can give us abundance maps in the end. And 
yeah, Demolish, for example, was um, calibrated by optimizing demographic rates. Um, the lollipop was um, calibrated by optimizing abundance. And then lastly, we had those hierarchical models that um, simultaneously that use Bayesian approach um, to simultaneously estimate the dispersal and the processes and the niche. And um, they also optimized abundance. So what we got out is that, first of all, dynamic approaches do improve range predictions. So you can see that here quite um, um, efficiently that we have the um, prediction accuracy under current climate for the uh, five different model families over all of the different community and demographic scenarios that we ran. And here you have the prediction accuracy under future climate. And you see that um, the efficiency of SDMs drops quite tremendously compared to the dynamic range, uh, to the dynamic predictions. But we also found that all of the dynamic predictions like lost some predictive accuracy. And that was mainly to do with how well we predict the leading edge of the, um, of the species ranges when the species are constrained by biotic interactions or if we high, have high stochasticity in the system. Um, these are the full results, the very detailed results. I don't want you to understand uh, everything from that graphic. The most important point is that you don't see any specific pattern, right? Um, a few more information that we analyzed different metrics uh, for predictive success. We analyzed overall predictive accuracy. We analyzed the errors in predicting the range centers and margins. We analyzed the errors in the absolute and relative abundances. And um, the squares, um, like this dark square here, will tell you about which were the models um, that made best predictions. And the light colored uh, um, squares actually indicate under current um, environmental conditions, the dark squares under future environmental conditions. And you see that these squares are all over the place, meaning there is no single best modeling approach for predicting biodiversity dynamics. And also these um, light gray boxes and dark gray boxes are not always at the same place, meaning that predictive accuracy today is not indicative of predictive accuracy in the future, which is quite important. And we also saw that structural uncertainty needs to be much better quantified. So meaning that it's not only important to incorporate processes, but you have to capture the right processes. Otherwise the models can be even worse than SDMs. Um, but we also need more guidance for data integration. We see that this is still a huge problem and a major obstacle for wider usage of these models. So therefore, I want to give you like a few perspectives um, what we do in my team. So um, our main goal is really improving the predictive capacity. And we um, do that in in four different places, or I also see like still potential in researching these four different items. Um, model testing, um, there's still loads to do to understand about these models. As you've seen, this can be done using a virtual ecologist approach and it can produce useful guidelines for users, um, but also for this big assessment reports. Method development, I will show you a little bit more about the platform that we are developing and using at the moment. Um, but we also need still more fundamental research to get a better process understanding of these six key mechanisms um, in order to represent them well in our models and also to represent the drivers that are important. And then data integration is still a major um, development field. We can think about how we use proper um, statistical methods for doing process attribution to say like which processes have been contributing to the different biodiversity dynamics that we are observing. But we also need data integration for running scenarios and informing stakeholders. So we are uh, currently uh, with partners in Aberdeen, we are further developing the individual based eco evolutionary platform range shifter we've just published an R package for that. Um, for running at the moment these coupled models with different processes with demography dispersal but also genetics and what we find nice about this platform is. Um, that it's modular. So it allows you to, um, to use different complexity of processes. So for example, dispersal 
Um, you can model that by a dispersal kernel, but you can also choose to model that by um, stochastic movement simulation. Um, demography, you can choose to model that with logistic growth, but also with like a complex stage structure. And this is where we see the future that we need more such modular systems where the user can really choose what to do. And I just want to highlight that, of course, it's also super important to understand um, which processes we should include. And there, all of us can do much more research for understanding, for example, what are key life stages, uh, key stages in the annual cycle and how are they affected by environment. What I mean by that, here you see a two-stage uh, model, juveniles and adults, and all of these stages can be differently affected by environment, right? So juvenile survival may be mainly driven by temperature extremes, whereas reproduction may be driven by the availability of resources. Dispersal may differ between different landscape contexts, and adult survival may or may not depend on environment. If we have migratory species, then it's even more complex because the adult survival may actually depend on environmental conditions, not only in the breeding range, but also in the wintering range and might depend on the route between those ranges. So what are they doing during migration, et cetera? And we need to understand that better in order to inform our models. Um, then we're almost at the end. Um, what's also important to put all this into a proper statistical framework. So here you see an example of an inverse modeling cycle based on Bayesian statistics, where we use all that we know of the species as prior information, for example, to set um, parameters of demographic rates. Um, we can use examples from meta-analysis and experiments to set biotic interactions or to set dispersal. And then we multiply that uh, prior information with a likelihood function that um, is basically the goodness of fit and compares predicted against observed uh, data, potentially based on different patterns on occupancy, on population dynamics, and so on. And as a result, we get a posterior distribution. Sorry for that. <laughs> we get a posterior distribution that quantifies the uncertainty in predictions and can be used to select and improve models. And this is really where I see future work that we need to think about how do we do multi-model selection to account for structural uncertainty? How can we better attribute um, processes that are responsible for dynamics? How can we do model validation and monitoring? Um, model validation that's still um, in its infancy when we come to those dynamic models, right? The cross-validation, what we talk about in statistical models, that's um, quite advanced and we're not there yet for our dynamic models or not, uh, it's not standard yet. Yeah, so that's really just as a perspective that there are different avenues that we um, can follow up upon on um, improving predictive capacity on dynamic approaches and hopefully um, to um, come up with uh, like good management scenarios to bend this curve of biodiversity loss. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions if we have time. <laughs> <laughs>